Well, welcome back, everyone, to another Sporting Blog podcast. Uh, we're certainly up and running uh, for the winter months, although judging by the backdrop to the guest I'm about to welcome, winter looks a little different in his location than it does in mine. Um, but look, let me just uh, first of all warmly welcome Lee Steinberg to the podcast. Lee, how's it going? It's going very well, thank you. Um, for those that don't know, Lee is a, a legendary sports agent, and I'll let you do your own intro. But just for just for some context, uh, Lee has famously represented eight for overall number one first round draft picks uh, in the NFL draft, forty plus first round uh, draft picks in total. And, and actually, I didn't realize Lee to my uh, to my discredit that you'd actually managed uh, athletes outside of the NFL as well with uh, with boxing on your roster with uh, our own Lennox Lewis, uh, which was very pleasing to hear. But uh, why don't you just give the, uh, the the audience a quick backdrop to your career and, and, what's been, and how you've worked in sports all these years? I went to school at uh, University of California, Berkeley. And when I was in law school, they put the freshman football team into my dorm. And one of the students was C. Bartkowski, and in 1975, he became the very first pick in the first round of the NFL draft, and he asked me to represent him. So there I was, brimming with legal experience. Well, the field of agency was very rudimentary at that point. They could just hang up the phone and say, we don't deal with agents. But I started with the philosophy that athletes could serve as role models. And if they retrace their roots and go back to the high school community that helped shape them, set up a scholarship fund, Boys and Girls Club, they could put down roots at the collegiate level, too, with the university alums setting up programs and then a charitable foundation uh, with leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders to execute a program that would enhance the quality of life. So that was work done putting the 200th single mother in the first home they'll ever own, or Patrick Mahomes with his 15 in the Mahomes. And, yep. uh, so that was the philosophy. And in football, I ended up with half the starting quarterback some weekends, 64 first-round draft picks, 12 players are in the Hall of Fame, uh, a big baseball practice, a basketball practice, um, as you said, boxing with Oscar De La Hoya and Lennox Lewis. Wrote a couple best-selling books along the way, and uh, <clears throat> volunteered as the technical advisor on films like uh, Jerry Maguire and uh, Any Given Sunday and For the Love of the Game. And uh, so here we are 50 years later. So in the words of my mother, you've definitely been busy. Uh, it seems like you've accomplished an awful lot and and seen uh, pretty much everything. But one of the the, the reasons uh, we reached out was actually to discuss um, was discussed more broadly NFL, but it's particularly the NFL and it, and its presence here in the UK. Now, a caveat: I am a Tottenham Hotspur fan. I had a season ticket at the stadium. So, um, ever since the stadium has been built. We've uh, we've had the association with the NFL. I was there last weekend for the for the Ravens uh, Titans game, and uh, I just want to put to you actually a question: how how is the NFL uh, series in London, whether it be at Wembley or at, at Tottenham? How's that generally received by NFL fans in the US? Well, we get to watch the games. You now I'm on the West Coast, and the games start at six thirty a.m. Uh, the three that have happened from London uh, or 9.30 uh, the other side. But it's a lot of fun. And people are aware that London fans have embraced the sport. When Buffalo played over there, they were uh, ringing cowbells. They were doing all the cheers that the Buffalo fans would do. You see people dressed up in NFL uh, clothing. Uh, they're totally into it. And, and like in Tottenham, you see a sellout. And so there um so the sports view is very popular now remember that for most americans london is one of our favorite cities in the world um you know we love to be there anyway for the 
history, the museums, the art, the, the Broadway uh, plays, uh, the traditions. So um, it's been a, a, a very positive uh, experience. I think they played like 40 something games over there, 36 of which are regular season games. And so for a series of weeks, they played like a game a week here in the early season. So as many games were coming from London uh, as from any place else. So it's uh, it's an interesting take because when the stadium was built uh, at Tottenham, uh, it was clear to most of us that you don't build a stadium with NFL changing rooms, NFL standard, uh, obviously the pitch and everything like this, if your plan longer term is only to play two games a year. So what what before we get on to the 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 possibility of a Super Bowl in, in the UK. What do you think the genuine possibility of a full-time franchise in London might be? And how would that go down with the fans? It would, it in every way, London qualifies as an NFL franchise type city. It's got the population. It's got the reach, the market's bigger. It extends to the rest of uh, Europe. It's got the population. It has the resources to handle um, people coming into town to watch the game from other places. So it's got the hotels and, and all the rest of it. And it brings you a whole new market, which is Europe. Um, there's only one glaring impediment, which is travel time, because most um, coaches like to establish a routine during the season. And um, on Sunday, you play the game, and on Monday, you, you check in, and on Tuesday, you have off, and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So when you introduce the fact that for me to fly to London is 12 hours from the West Coast and seven hours, um, you get the problems of jet lag. You get the problems of being taken out of your regular season uh, schedule. Uh, Jacksonville came up with a unique way to do it, which was to stay there for a week. So they acclimated. So they stayed there between games. So the problem is only that the circadian rhythm of the players, the jet lag, uh, all the rest. If if London was in the continental United States, it would have had a franchise for 40 years. And so the question is, is there a way to solve uh, that? Is there a way to come in early? The challenge is just that a team doesn't want to come to London, get out of the rhythm of their week in the middle of the season, and um, have all that travel time. So if you're traveling from Seattle or the San Francisco Bay Area or Los Angeles, it's 12 hours over, 14 back, depending on the wind. And um, uh, other than that, it qualifies in every single way. And Americans are acutely aware that pro football is our passion, the number one sport and number one television uh, draw. But for the rest of the world, it's your football or soccer. And so um, the NFL would like to break that. So all of the experiences have been uh, positive. And the, the fans have been just great, and the coverage has been great. And uh, um, the players who don't care about the routine um, love the experience because they're tourists in London, too. Do you think that it, uh, based on everything you've just said, do you think that if a franchise were to make it to London, whether it be a, an expansion or, or one of the existing franchises, that it might give them quite a big home advantage based on the the fact that the other team has to travel and all of that stuff. Would would any players or other owners find that problematic, do you think? Yes. So that's the challenge. Otherwise, it would have happened already. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, London qualifies in every single uh, aspect for uh, to be in an NFL city. Um, the games sell out. You would get people playing fantasy uh, at a much higher level. You get a memorabilia sale. Um, that stadium could have naming rights. Um, and yep. uh, uh, 
Uh, you've got the support of gambling now, which the Washington commanders are doing in stadium. You've got, it, it would be a financial bonanza and it would have a high, high franchise value. It's only the travel. So the question is, are there ways in which you could equalize out the schedule um, so that, for example, a team from the West Coast goes back and plays one game on the East Coast and then over to London and then, then back to, to an East Coast uh, destination? Could, are there creative ways to, to blunt the, um, uh, the challenges of uh, jet lag and travel time um, and if people put their mind to it, they can do it. Totally agree. Uh, in your opinion, and uh, most of the audience here listening probably wouldn't know either way, but do you think that it would likely be a new franchise or one of the existing teams that picked up and uh, moved to London? All the existing teams are doing well. The, in terms of attendance, they sell out. In terms of sponsorship and big corporations, uh, they do fine. Uh, we're at a pitch fever right now in terms of the fact that 81 of the top 100 television shows last year were NFL football. So it's not only the most popular sport in America, it's the most popular form of televised entertainment. And so um, it would be an expansion team. Well, that that really is exciting. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that the, the Tottenham owner, uh, and there's quite a lot of politics around this, especially if you're a Tottenham fan like myself, but the fact that the stadium hasn't picked up any naming rights yet, the fact that it was designed in such a way, uh, we're pretty sure that they will be trying to lobby to, to have a permanent franchise there anytime soon. Now, um, with that aside, which would be very exciting, and by the way, I agree with everything you said, because it, they would fill up the stadium no problem every week. It would not be an issue whatsoever. Um, there has been a slightly less popular suggestion that I've seen doing the rounds online this week that maybe even the Super Bowl itself might wake its way to London. What's your opinion on A, could that actually happen? And B, what do you think about that? So the Super Bowl has become a convention of Americana. It's big business, big corporations come into the city, take over hotels, get some of the tickets. It's big political figures, it's big entertainment figures. It's a week of raucous partying where um, there are parties every night, multiple parties for all sorts of uh, different causes. You probably get two or 300,000 extra people coming into the city. So again, look at, and the awarding of the Super Bowl has become partly a uh, reward for building a new stadium. So mm -hmm. it'll be in Las Vegas this year. They built a new stadium. It was in Los Angeles. They built a new stadium. And then there's a fundamental rotation, which uh, tends to be New Orleans, the Florida cities, uh, the, the good weather cities. So if you look at, at, at London, the again, the only impediment is travel time because um, you will get, in, first of all, London has the capacity to handle with hotel rooms and um, accommodations all of those extra people that will come to the city. And no, it's already a tourist uh, destination, so it's well able to, to handle that. Um, remember that, that not everybody stays right in the city. It, it enhances all the surrounding communities that were within an hour and an hour and a half travel time. Um, and you get, I throw a Super Bowl party every year that's got 4,000 of my closest friends. And uh, we, we it's, it's a mix of the entertainment worlds and everything else. So I think you could do it once uh, in the rotation teams even without the new stadiums there's 
a couple warm weather sites they tend to favor miami um uh, new orleans uh phoenix uh the, san diego was in the rotation los angeles um and um but but i think they could get one um again everything is about travel time in other words if if london was five hours from here um they'd already have had a super bowl along with the awarding of a franchise so the point is could they host one in grand fashion they could host one um uh, uh people in that city know what to do and how to accommodate huge events um they understand all, all the rest of it um would it be a great holiday for people absolutely um my favorite city in the world to visit outside of new york is london and so uh it would have a big big draw and the novelty of it would make it even uh more popular so i think they could do it once well you can make the invite list 4001 if you come here and have the party i, I will <laughs> be available <laughs> i'll be available uh no the interesting thing was obviously i saw um some social you know sports common Tators and pundits decrying the idea of taking the most American event on earth and moving it to Europe. Um, I, I don't know whether that's just bluster because it helps people, you know, grab views, or whether, you know, for example, if you were, a, I don't know, let's say a 49ers fan or, or a Chargers fan and you've got to the Super Bowl and maybe you go every week, would it be a big, would you be? pissed off that it was going to London and that you weren't able to watch it, you know, in America, or, or maybe it would be the most exciting trip. I mean, um, it, it's hard to say. Well, really. well for, first of all, they figure out a way to adjust the time it was played so that it um, uh, plays in, in it, it's on a Sunday. It starts at uh, two o'clock our time in the afternoon, five o'clock East Coast time. So how that equates with London time, they, they would just figure that out. Um, that's no different than the Olympics or any other right. international event. Um, and the fact that it's uh, an American tradition, um, the NFL innovates all the time for all sorts of reasons, uh, does novel things it hasn't done before. Um, it's not like anyone would look at that from the standpoint of nationalism and say, you can't take our Super Bowl. Um, London, um, remember, there's a strong sense in this country that, that we are the prodigy of England, right? We, we evolved from, from our English uh, roots. And so it's not looked at the same way that it would be if it was in Kuala Lumpur, you know, right. or or Nepal or some alternative. It's like uh, they we speak the same language, we eat the same food, we um, uh, we have a, a, a whole lot of commonalities. So that I don't think is an issue. Okay, well, that's good to know, and um, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Before we uh, before we let you go, I think one other thing I just wanted to, to talk about is that you've been in the you've been in the NFL game for some time now, and you would have seen the changes in in styles of play, in contact rules, in marketing, and the whole the whole thing has changed beyond recognition, I imagine, since when you first got involved. What if you could pick one way that the NFL has improved? And one way it's gotten worse. What what would those two things maybe be? Well, the the major impediment is just the fact it's a contact game, so that you um, have incredibly well trained bodies, bigger, stronger, faster, and they're colliding, <clears throat> so it gives you a concussion problem. And that has remained, even though there's a concussion protocol. Um, the injury rate is uh, is is sort of frightening the way in which it improved is every way it's converted into a modern passing game which is much more <clears throat> exciting the ways that you can enjoy it uh the internet didn't exist years before and now you can be on twitter or uh, linkedin or any of the 
the content supply, the memorabilia is better, the way in which it's televised uh, is better. Uh, football sort of grew up in this country with television and the the camera angles and the way they bring it into action is, is great. You have jumbo scoreboards, big luxury boxes, premium seating. Um, you've got fantasy sports, which 40 million people a week play fantasy football here. Um, now you have gambling, which you always was there, but this is the first time that it's been sanctioned. Uh, a team in Las Vegas, um, uh, the ability to bet at one stadium. Um, and um, uh, so really, uh, this is a sport in, in its prime that continues to, to evolve. They use the game for social issues. They care about breast cancer and, and at-risk kids. Um, so the role modeling aspect has become stronger too. So uh, it's uh, integrated into the uh, falls of uh, the winter months and fall months uh, as an institution. Yeah, it's an interesting point you bring up regarding the concussion protocol. Our last podcast guest a few days ago was a rugby union uh, writer who's just published a book called Concussed, which is about the concussion issues we have in rugby. And obviously the Rugby World Cup is happening as we speak. Uh, England narrowly lost in the semi-final, unfortunately. But the final this weekend uh, coming between New Zealand and South Africa, you will see 300-pound monsters, frankly, who can run the 100 metres in 11, 12 seconds, colliding with each other at pace. And obviously... The NFL is the same, but features helmets, which can do even more damage, I think, than, than the protection. Do you think that the sport, and by the way, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, someone that's espousing that we should re remove contact or anything at all. But what I do see every week uh, are people bringing up the fact that, you know, these people's lives could possibly be at risk. Do you think we're ever at danger of seeing the contact element not removed, but softened to the point that the game or the and an NFL fundamentally changes? I think there are changes we can make now that will uh, make the situation safer. I've had 17 concussion conferences that I've held with neurologists from across the country. And there are things you can do. You can teach uh, young kids not to block and tackle with the head. You can stop people from playing tackle football uh, until a certain age, at least so you get into high school so that you're not as high a risk with the brain. They have um, uh, college conferences that don't hit in the off season, don't hit during training camp and don't hit during practice. They just model the play. So you take it out of 40% of concussions uh, in that way. There are also uh, startling advances in, in brain health happening where uh, from the standpoint of neuroplasticity, um, you can, heal a concussed brain with a couple different techniques so it can get better. Um, and incidentally, I've been helping a new potential professional rugby league here in uh, America uh, that they're trying to set up because uh, we love the way you play rugby and think it would be a great professional sport here. Well, I was actually talking about this with my father just yesterday um, about you know the the um, major league cricket has has launched not long back in the states. Uh, rugby in Canada has always been you know reasonably popular, and we were saying there must be a reasonable amount of athletes that that don't make college uh, American football that that would certainly be quite handy on the rugby pitch maybe if if their skills could be applied to that. So um, well I'll certainly follow that with interest because a, a major league rugby product is what rugby needs because actually at, at international level rugby is one of the great sports to watch but where it's struggling is is especially in england is at the club level premier league rugby is not really as popular but international rugby england south africa um a few nights ago was probably one of the most watched events of the year so amazing stuff look we won't keep you too long because it looks like you're about to start your day i suppose we'll just leave with 
with one question that I guess everyone asks you all the time, who's your pick to uh, go all the way this year in the NFL and, and win the Super Bowl? <laughs> um, I still would uh, pick Kansas City. I'm a little biased because I'm Mahomes, but I would pick Kansas City probably against San Francisco. Well, that would be one hell of a game. Look, Lee, thanks so much for, for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure and uh, and an honour to get uh, your uh, take on, on all things NFL. Uh, what are you up to in life? Uh, why don't you let the audience know what you're up to right now? Oh, what I'm up to? Well, uh, it's uh, it's only uh, 10 o'clock here in the morning, so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's time to go to the office and uh, <clears throat> do some big contracts. Good. Well, you've done that all your career and uh, we wish you the very best with it. But thanks for joining us and uh, we'll speak soon. My pleasure.